The use of caches in a system, well, it affects how we store data and instructions in our main memory. And you're thinking, wait a minute, how can the caches themselves affect main memory? Well, let's take a little slice of main memory. And the key here is that we're looking at the addressing. So I'm gonna put a whole bunch of memory locations here. And remember, when we started talking about accessing memory, I made the comment that, you know, it just so happens that the vast majority of memories out there store data as a byte. So each one of, if you're looking at the width of a single memory location, you're looking at eight bits. All right, so each memory location is gonna store eight bits. And let's just say that this memory is a slice taken out of the full range of memory. And so I'm gonna just make some addresses here. How about, uh, and, and I'm, you know, in order, seems like a theme with this cache is saving board space, but I'm only gonna use a few bits to identify this. So let me go ahead and, and address or create the addresses for some of these locations. All right, so I've created some addresses here. Now, the key is, is that, well, a lot of machines for data and instructions have values that are larger than just simply a byte. So whenever we store something into one of these memory locations, we're actually looking at taking up multiple memory locations. So if I've got four bytes that I'm storing, in fact, we'll go back and talk about the ARM processor. We have a 32-bit ARM processor. Every single instruction takes four bytes, all right? Now, the problem is that, remember, when we started talking about blocks and how the cache brings a block from memory, how does it do that? How does it decipher the block? Well, remember that there are a certain number of bits that are used as the word ID. And so let's go ahead and just say that the word ID bits, there's two of them, which means that the, a block goes for the last two bits, it goes 00011011. So that right there is a block. 00011110, that's a block. 00011011, there's a block. And so they're identified by, you know, there's least two significant bits. That identifies a block. Okay, now let's just talk about storing data or instructions. In fact, let's go ahead and talk about an ARM instruction, the 32-bit instruction. If I stored that instruction starting at this location right here, and my block size is four, then what happens is, is that that instruction would straddle two blocks. And in order to execute that instruction, the cache would need to bring in two blocks, take up two lines of the cache. This isn't a good idea. If the, ca if the instruction would have fit in a single line of the cache, assuming that we only have block sizes of four, then you'd only bring in one line if I can align my, ca my instruction with the blocks. Even going beyond that, you know, the block size, it may actually be 16, which means that four bits are used to identify the block ID. Once again, if I have an instruction that starts here at address 1110, it would pass from one block into the next block, and you don't want to do that. To solve that, most processors, or all, you know, the vast majority of machines out there, adhere to something called data structure alignment. Now, data structure alignment says that the size of the the size of the element that I'm trying to store forces it to be stored at certain at certain partitions in our memory. And the way it works is this, that the the address where an n byte value is stored must be divisible by n. Now, that seems sort of weird, but think about this. That, <laughs> let's get that right. Anyway, an n byte 
usually the n is a power of two. So we have one byte, which means that by n being one byte, I could store it at any one of these locations because all of those locations are divisible by one, right? And think about it this way. If I have a single byte, it's impossible for it to straddle blocks. If I have a two byte uh, value, 16 bits, then the address has to be divisible by two. In other words, it can only be stored on even boundaries. And by storing it on even boundaries, we know, for example, if our block size is four, then I could store a pair of bytes here or a pair of bytes here. That would make it so that it wouldn't cross boundaries. The only way I could cross boundaries is if I stored that two byte value at an address ending in a one, which is an odd non-divisible by two boundary. A four byte value only divisible by four. And so when we're talking about the instructions that are going into an ARM processor, those 32-bit instructions, they can only be on uh, address boundaries that are divisible by four. Now, it's actually pretty easy to figure out if something is divisible by four. If you go way, way back in our lessons, you remember that a division by a power of two is really the same as a right shift, right? And so in order for something to be divisible by a power of two, then there must be that power, the, the power that that power of two is raised to. In other words, like two to the two or two to the one or two to the three, that exponent, there must be that number of zeros on the right hand side of the expression. So for example, if something is divisible by four, it has to have the two least significant bits as zero. So zero, zero, so zero is divisible by four. Four, one, zero, zero in binary is divisible by four. Eight, one, zero, 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 that's divisible by four. And C, or a decimal 12, is also divisible by, tw by four. So you look at these two least significant bits, if they're zero, then you know that you can start the address there. So in the ARM processor, if you were to look at all the instructions, they all land on either on an address where the last nibble is either zero, four, eight, or C. That's it. That's where they're going to start. And that's to make sure that it doesn't go across block boundaries. Now, if you have something that is an eight byte value divisible by eight, then there are going to be three zeros. So we can only start it at zero, 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 or, you know, it's at, at a value that ends in zero or a nibble that ends in eight. Those are the only two places that they'll land. All right, really important stuff. Now, kind of as a consequence of that, and, and, and we really haven't talked much about this, we also need to address something called Indianness. <laughs> it's a very weird word, isn't it? Well, Indianness says, you know, that 32 byte, excuse me, that 32 bit value that I'm gonna have to store in four memory locations, which one goes first? Which byte do I store first? Do I start at the, at the larger end, the most significant byte end, and store it in order? Or do I store it in reverse order where I store from the least significant byte end and, and store it all the way up to the most significant? Now, in, you, in your own mind, you may think, well, that's a no-brainer, we do it this way. Well, that may be true for you, but somebody else may think another way. And it turns out that they really are two different ways. Some processors store least byte first, some processors store largest byte first. And the way it works is this. If you think about the size of the bytes as being large, big, or small, little, there's big Indian. That means that the most significant byte is stored first. In other words, in the lower addresses. So you start out the most significant byte in the most in the first address, and then as you go down to the smaller values, go to least significant. So the little Indian, guess what? It's stored least significant byte first. Now, to make sure that we understand this, let's just go ahead and do an example. So let's say that I've got the hexadecimal value, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So 32, 32 bits 
four bytes. So we're, we know right up front we're going to have to divide this into bytes and store them one byte at a time. The question is, is do I store it one, two first, and then three, four, and then five, six, and then seven, eight, or do I store it seven, eight, five, six, three, four, one, two? Well, if you were to do it big Indian, so I'm gonna start out here and I'm gonna to adhere to my data structure alignment. So my address has to be divisible by four. So it has to end in zero, zero. And we'll just grab this address right here. It was one, zero, zero, the one that ends in a, in, a, in a hexadecimal four. And if we do one, two, then three, four, then five, six, then seven, eight, this right here is a big Indian. That's one way to store it. If, however, our machine is set up for little Indian, then we would store it 7, 8, 5, 6, 3, 4, 1, 2. So this is little Indian. Now, you may think, well, not a big deal. You know, if I'm, if I'm storing data as, in one way, either big Indian or little Indian, I'm just going to read it the same way, right? I, I'm going to write what I expect to read. That's good, except what if we are sharing data with another processor that uses a different architecture that uses the little Indian and we're storing as big Indian? All of our values are going to be backwards. So there has to be some sort of identifier or identification in files and so forth that says, by the way, if you're reading this file, we're reading with this Indian this. All right. Just a little side, just a little side topic, um, but I just wanted to make sure that you understand that the fact that we are using caches and transferring data back and forth in the form of blocks, it has an effect on how our data is stored in memory.